Okay, we're recording now. So we're starting chapter 13, Temperature and Kinetic Theory, which is basically the start of thermodynamics for us. So we haven't done any thermodynamics yet. Um, this chapter comes uh, kind of in a set of three chapters, which we're not gonna have time to cover everything. We're just gonna be able to cover this chapter. Um, chapter 14 is heat. Heat is a form of energy that is exchanged between two thermodynamic systems. And there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do with that um, and a bunch of different phenomena we can explain including like phase changes and um, just a, a bunch of different stuff and then uh, chapter 15 which is the laws of thermodynamics we'll actually see what we call the zeroth law of thermodynamics in this chapter it's kind of a simple um, statement about thermodynamic equilibrium but um, in any case, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started here with um, this chapter. So everything in thermodynamics is based on the idea that we have atoms which comprise all of matter. Okay, so atoms are these indivisible, indivisible. building blocks. And let's put indivisible in quotations because atoms are divisible. Um, but the original Greek uh, word for atoms basically means indivisible. Um, so that uh, kind of jargon has stuck around for a while. So indivis uh, indivisible building blocks. I think most of us are kind of already familiar with this, but let's just quickly do a review, you know, atoms, kind of the modern picture of an atom is that you have like a nucleus here, and then you have um, kind of a region around the nucleus, and I'll label this stuff. So this here is the nucleus, And then this region kind of on the outside of the nucleus is called the electron cloud. Oops. Electron cloud. Um, and what's in the nucleus, so the nucleus is comprised of neutrons and protons and of course um, at the time that a lot of what we're going to talk about today was discovered people didn't even know about atoms necessarily yet so um, some of the things, obviously, um, people knew about atoms, but I mean, a lot of the phenomena you could observe without knowing anything about atoms, right? And so um, for a long period of time, a lot of the physics was done, a lot of the physics and chemistry was done without this idea of atoms. Um, so the nucleus is comprised of neutrons and protons that most of what we're gonna do, most of the people who discovered what we're gonna look at today, um, <laughs> did not know anything about neutrons or protons or electrons, which are in the electron cloud. Okay, and so these are like the three kind of building blocks of the atom. And actually these ones even have more building blocks, surprisingly, this is like very, in, in, you know, very modern discovery of what's called quarks. So these are made up of quarks here. These are particles which were, um, I think, theorized as early as maybe the 50s or 60s, 1950s, 1960s, and um, of course were de uh, detected, you know, several decades after that, maybe around the 80s, 90s, possibly the 70s. I'm not exactly sure on the exact history, but it's a very recent. Um, a very recent discovery. Um, most of the stuff that we're going to do in this chapter is very old, like, you know, 1600s, 1700s. Um, so, but very relevant 
for applications even today. All right, um, electrons are not made up of quarks. Um, electrons are what we would call a fundamental particle like quarks. So quarks and electrons, we would call those fundamental particles, meaning they are indivisible. So these ones right here, these ones are indivisible. As far as we know, we cannot break these ones down further. But um, neutrons and protons obviously have broken down into quarks. They each have three quarks of different, what we would call flavors. Okay, um, <clears throat> the electron cloud here is what gives the atom its size. So this determines the atom's size. The electron cloud, which is quite interesting because although the electron cloud determines the size of the atom, it's the nucleus which has most of the mass of the atom. So the atom's mass, I should probably put apostrophe S here. The atom size is determined by the electron cloud and the atom's mass is determined by its nucleus. Now there is some mass to an electron, but the uh, mass of a proton or a neutron which is about the same, but not exactly the same, whoops, neutron, is approximately 2,000 times the mass of an electron. So the atom's mass is concentrated in the nucleus, but what determines the atom's size is actually the electron cloud. And the reason that that's the case it has a lot to do with what you'll learn next semester uh, when you study um, electrical forces. Um, so the electrons, when they come, when it, when two electron clouds come close together, they will repel each other, or they could have a chemical reaction and start sharing their electron clouds, something along those lines. Um, but most often, like if I take my hand and I push it down on the table, the reason my hand doesn't pass through the table is because the electron clouds of all the atoms on my hand and the electron clouds of all the um, atoms on the table are repelling each other. Right? Um, so it's the electron cloud that gives the size, it's the nucleus that gives the mass. Any questions about any of that stuff? Can give me a thumbs up if um, that's making sense. Is this a review for most of you? Maybe you can let me know if that's mostly review. So um, your book likes to talk about um, the atomic mass unit. So the atomic mass unit. which they call 1U, which maybe if you've taken chemistry, you've seen before. Um, 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Um, this number uh, is, I believe, slightly less than the mass of, um, slightly less than the mass of a proton. I believe the mass of a proton is uh, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Um, the mass of a neutron is roughly the same, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And if you wanna know the exact mass, well, not the exact, but uh, the, the mass of an electron it's uh, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So you can go and check that the mass of the proton is roughly 2,000 times um, the mass of an electron. It's about, I think if I remember correctly, it's 1,834 times the mass of the electron. And the mass of a neutron is like 1,836 times the mass 
of an electron. So very small difference in mass between the proton and neutron. Okay. Um, we can combine atoms um, and form, you know, uh, compounds, right? Chemical reactions, uh, ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and all that stuff. But that's mostly chemistry. So I kind of want to just focus mostly on the physics part. And um, I want to show um, quickly a diagram from the book here. And actually, I'm just going to show part of this figure here. And the reason I want to show this figure is because it describes the motion of atoms in a liquid and a gas. Okay, So um, we say that atoms or molecules or particles, uh, what, what have you, are undergoing um, what we would call Brownian motion. So let's put, let's write it down. So atoms and molecules undergo a random motion. And I'm gonna put random in quotation marks because I don't want you to think that it's completely random. It's, it's what we call pseudo random, but let's avoid like going into too much jargon here. So the atoms and molecules undergo a random motion due to collisions with their neighbors. Now it's not really random because um, of course, all of the physics, we would never throw away all of the physics that we've done up until this point, right? Um, we can describe the motion of these atoms. The problem is, is as we'll see shortly, there's so many atoms and the atoms are so small and undergo so many collisions in just a fraction of a second that it's advantageous for us to instead of track the exact motion of all of the particles or all the atoms or molecules and just look at the system kind of as a whole and say, okay, we've got all these atoms here and they're all moving kind of randomly. Uh, and they're, if we know the velocity of one particular atom at one instant in time, if we were to look at that atom's velocity one second later, we would see that it's completely different. So on our human time scale, everything is happening kind of randomly from what we see. But of course, we could still go in and apply the same physics we've learned up until this point to track every single atom. It would just require, you know, it would just require supercomputers basically to track everything. So there's no sense in trying to track everything. Uh, let me finish writing this sentence here. So atoms and molecules undergo a random motion due to their to collision with their neighbors. So I was already almost done with that. Okay, um, this is called uh, Brownian motion, and it was actually a biologist who discovered this kind of um, random motion, studying uh, pollen grains in um, a water solution. So um, he noticed that uh, under the microscope that these pollen grains were actually seem to be kind of vibrating around and kind of randomly would kind of go to the right and up and down and then maybe come back a little bit and go up and come back and and the average motion is zero the average displacement is zero but that doesn't necessarily mean that a particle couldn't veer off and end up somewhere you know um, a great distance away from its starting position it's just that on average most molecules will kind of stay where they are um, so this random motion is called brownian motion named after um named after uh i can't remember his first name but um brown he was a biologist uh, brownian motion and surprisingly enough of all the great contributions that einstein made to physics this is one of them. He was the first to mathematically describe Brownian motion. 
And he did that in 1905, the same year that he published his paper on special relativity. So he was really uh, doing great things um, just out of uh, graduate school. Okay, so Brownian motion. Uh, what does it look like? Well, it looks like these um, molecules over here or over here. So we can kind of tell all of the particles kind of have their velocities in a random direction here. And what's eventually going to happen, for example, let me highlight in yellow here so it really stands out. If I look at perhaps this particle right here and this one right here, those two look like they're on a collision course, right? And when those two particles collide with each other, their velocities are going to change, right? And that's going to continue to happen over and over and over again um, for all of these different molecules and, or atoms here. So like, for example, these two, let me maybe use orange this time. These two look like maybe they're on a crash course as well. And so again, these two velocities will change and all these changes are occurring very rapidly on time scales of roughly nanoseconds. So every nanosecond or so there's a collision for one particle. And of course, that's on average. So there could be, uh, there, there could, it could happen that one molecule doesn't have any collisions for 10 nanoseconds in a row, but that would be a very um, low probability uh, event. So um, on average, it's roughly every nanosecond. Okay. Um, any questions about that um, description there of uh, Brownian motion? Give me a thumbs up if we're good to move forward. Okay, and now I'll, I will um, briefly discuss quickly what happens with a solid. Now solids are a little bit different they're not undergoing these constant collisions like liquids and gases and plasmas, if you want to. Um, solids have a very uh, structured, um, they're, they may have um, a crystalline structure like this one that's shown here, or they might not, but in general for solids, atoms kind of stay put or, or molecules if you have something, if, if it's a non-metallic substance. Um, but they still undergo a lot of vibration. Okay? So all of the molecules here in this solid, you have to imagine they're kind of vibrating. Maybe you could um, add in a little bit of, uh, you know, like a little uh, lines like this to emphasize that these atoms are kind of vibrating in place. And um, we're gonna see shortly that this vibration here, um, is related to temperature and the velocities of the atoms in the liquids and the gases are also related to temperature. Okay, the idea of temperature, and we'll try to define um, what we mean when we say temperature. Okay, so let's go ahead and move, uh, let's go ahead and move forward. We're getting um, pretty close. Um, to, um, we're getting pretty close now. We're gonna talk about temperature scales. Quickly before we go to uh, temperature scales, there's an example in the book 13-1. Um, we're not gonna go through this, I'm not gonna give this example for you guys to work on, but they ask you to uh, estimate the average distance between the centers of neighboring co uh, copper atoms. So if you have some copper atoms, for example, you know, copper wire, copper is used a lot for um, uh, as a wire because it has low electrical resistance, which you'll learn about next semester. Um, and so they, they show you how to do that in the um, in this example. And uh, I just want to talk, I just want to briefly mention the answer. So the answer that they end up with is 2.3 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Okay, so atoms are an order of magnitude closer than a nanometer. Okay, so a nanometer. So this is distance. These are copper atoms up here. Let's go ahead and 
write this out. So distance between the copper atoms is this. And of course, we, we always remember our prefixes, right? One nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, right? So um, <clears throat> atoms are about an order of magnitude uh, 10 times closer than one nanometer. So they're very small. Okay, um, let's go ahead and go into temperature and thermometers. Okay, um, a thermometer is a device used to measure temperature and temperature we usually think of as how hot something is, right? So colloquially, temperature is how hot something is. And a thermometer measures temperature. Oops. Okay. Um, in order to measure something, right, you have to define uh, what you, you have to assign basically a numerical value, right? You have to have a scale. And actually in, in the uh, 1600s, 1700s, when a lot of this um, kind of physics was being developed, um, there were many, many, many different kinds of thermometers and many, many, many different temperature scales that people used. So it wasn't like you know, in the United States where everybody uses Fahrenheit or in, in um, the UK um, or like the rest of the world who uses Celsius, right? Um, there were many different temperature scales. In fact, in, uh, in modern research level physics, some of those temperature scales um, and even new ones are adapted for um, uh, certain physics and certain temperature ranges. It's advantageous to use uh, maybe a different temperature scale um, to keep numbers manageable, to keep numbers within a certain range. Um, uh, if I, uh, so even, uh, Isaac Newton had his own temperature scale. Okay. So if you want to define your own temperature scale, I'll show you how to do that here in a second. Okay. Um, let's take a look at, um, at quickly one type of thermometer. And that is a bimetallic strip. These are still in use today. If you open up your thermostat, you'll see a bimetallic strip in there. If you have an old one, if it's not digital. So a bimetallic strip is two sheets of metal. And I'll get a picture here for you in a second. Two sheets of metal. Um, layered next to each other or we could just say like layered. Yeah, let's just use that next to each other. I should say two, uh, sorry, two different sheets of metal, different metals. Um, and let's turn this into let's uh, let's turn this into what we need it to be. I don't want to just tell you what a bimetallic strip is. I want to tell you why it's used. So, a bimetallic strip is two different sheets of metal layered next to each other, so that when heated, the bimetallic strip. Uh, let's not do that. Let's just write it out. Bimetallic strip curls in one direction. We'll just just say it curls. So it's going to curl one way if it gets colder. It's going to it's going to curl another way if it gets hotter. Let's take a look at what exactly I mean here. So. 
let me pull up a little image here. Here is a bimetallic strip here. Okay, so a bimetallic strip, we take two different sheets of metal like we see here. So there's a green sheet and a blue sheet, right? Obviously metals are not blue and green, but um, we layer them next to each other. And because metals have different properties, right? If we take two different metals, they're gonna have different properties, right? If we heat them, one of those metals is gonna expand more than the other. Okay, so question for you guys, in the figure that I've shown you here, which metal is expanding more, the green one or the blue one? So simple question, which, which metal is expanding more, the green or blue metal? <laughs> Sounds kind of silly to say that out loud, the blue or the green metal, <laughs> okay. So which of those metals is expanding more, the green metal or the blue metal? All right, good. So everybody's getting it, good, right? Because it's on the outside, so it has to expand just a little bit more than the one on the inside, right? If you think of, of like the arc of a circle, right? You can think of it as like the arc of a circle where the center of the circle is like this point right here, right? You go further from the circle, then the circumference is bigger. Okay, so good. Um, so you can use that idea. You don't have to know anything about um, temperature uh, scales. You don't have to know anything about um, well, you, you have to know that temperature is kind of telling you how hot something is, but um, you don't need to know anything about any kind of special thermometers or any temperature scales or anything. If you build a bimetallic strip on some day and you write the date down that you built it, and then on some other day it's curling um, to the right, then you know that it's hotter on this day than it was on the day you created the bimetallic strip. And the opposite of that is true as well. So if the metallic strip contracts, so if, if metals expand when they're heated, they will, they will also contract when they're cooled, right? Um, it will actually curl the other way. So um, if we were to look at a situation where it's cooled, then it would look like this. So if it's cooled a little bit, if it's colder than the day the strip was made, it would look something like this. Okay, so this would be colder. So this is like, let's call this maybe, maybe this is T0, that's the temperature, in, the initial temperature. Maybe this one is T1. This It's hotter on this day and this is T2. Okay, we might say something like, okay, T1 is bigger than T0. And T2 is, is less than T0, right? So, so T2, it's colder, right? So the temperature is lower, right? Uh, T1, is it's hotter. So the temperature is greater, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's the idea. So we don't really even need to know a scale. So the way we could build a scale from this thing, though, is we could measure how much curl there is, right? So I could put on the wall, maybe I, I put something right here, I put a scale right here. And, and, you know, and I label these, I put numbers here on this scale. And, and depending on how much this thing has curled, I call that, you know, uh, that's 10 degrees, that's 20 degrees, that's 30 degrees, and so forth. So if you wanted to, you could build a scale out of this, you could build a temperature scale, and you could assign numbers, you just make some marks, and you hold it up against the wall, you and, and look at how it's curled and make a reading of the temperature. Okay, let's go a little bit away from that though, and let's go to some concrete stuff that we're kind of already familiar with. So we'll look at Fahrenheit and we'll look at Celsius. Okay, um, surprising, uh, su surprisingly, um, the Fahrenheit temperature scale is defined via the Celsius temperature scale. 
So we'll start with a Celsius temperature scale. So we'll look at temperature scales now. And we'll stick to what we're familiar with here. So Celsius. Then we'll look at Fahrenheit. So Celsius temperature to, uh, scale is defined in the following way. Or used to be defined in the following way. As a matter of fact, the most modern definition of the Celsius scale is based on the triple point of water, which we're not going to talk about because it's it's it requires us to go a little bit further into thermodynamics. So we'll we'll use a definition of the Celsius scale that makes a lot of sense and is still useful. We don't have to get too technical um, in our definition here. The definition is zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water at one atmosphere. Freezing point of water at one ATM. Remember one ATM, ATM is a unit of pressure. It's one atmosphere of pressure. Uh, this is also equal to, as we saw, uh, 1.01 .01 times 10 to the five Pascals, right? Pascals a unit of pressure, right? So everything in physics building on top of each other, you'll see that in this chapter, we touch on pressure, we touch on, um, uh, there's a problem I put on one of the homework assignments related to uh, the stress and strain, um, which is pretty interesting, but not too difficult, so don't worry. Um, yeah, so zero degrees Celsius, freezing point of water. What's the boiling point of water? 100 degrees Celsius, right? Nice and simple. So this is the boiling point. Of course, at one atmosphere of pressure, these fr the freezing point and boiling point of water can change based on pressure. But if we pick a pressure, one atmosphere, then we fixed ourselves a temperature scale. So zero degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius, we've defined our temperature scale. Okay. Um, in between, we have 100 degrees between the freezing and boiling point. We could have just as easily um, made uh, the boiling point of water 150 degrees Celsius and had 150 degrees between the freezing and, and boiling point of water. That's kind of the idea here for Fahrenheit. Um, they just simply um, change the number of uh, demarcations between um, the freezing and boiling point. Let me see if I spelled Fahrenheit right. Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Um, the Fahrenheit scale is defined at one atmosphere, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit for the freezing point. And uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit for the boiling point. And again, I mean of water here. And so water. Um, the nice thing about the Fahrenheit scale, if you're wondering why it is still in use today, is because the Fahrenheit scale, although it does not align very well with um, a nice system of units, which is based on powers of 10, it is a very human-like scale, okay? Um, so the Fahrenheit scale is still in use because it's it's very it's 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 very human. Let's just describe it as that. It's very human. Um, we kind of understand that the temperature in Fahrenheit, if it's uh, you know if it's uh, it's typically 70, 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 
pretty much uh, that'll span a wide range of temperatures um, across the globe. And um, although, of course, there are some extreme cases where it's it's much colder than that, right? Um, between zero Fahrenheit and uh, 100 Fahrenheit, I mean, you've pretty much covered 99.9% of all temperatures on Earth. Um, and we mostly understand that if the temperature is in the triple digits on the Fahrenheit scale, we all pretty much understand that that is a hot temperature. Um, and we all pretty much understand that um, if the temperature is uh, down to, you know, 30, 20, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, we all understand that is a very cold temperature, right? Um, I don't know. It's, it's just a very human temperature scale, and I think that's why it's still in use today. Um, the Celsius scale is quite a bit um, different because temperatures, again, uh, range from your, your, your average everyday temperatures might be between 20 degrees Celsius and maybe 30 five-ish degrees Celsius, something like that. Anything above 35, you're starting to get into that hot range. If you're up at 40, it's, it's really hot. Um, if you're below 20, you know, it's starting to feel a little bit chilly, 10 degrees Celsius, you know, you're starting to get into that pretty cold region down at zero, right, is where you're going to need to be for like snow and stuff. So you're talking, it's very cold, negative Celsius, obviously is going to be uh, very cold. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Celsius is, I mean, even Celsius as a temperature scale is very arbitrary. The Celsius temperature scale is based on the absolute temperature scale known as the Kelvin scale. And even the Kelvin scale is not the only absolute temperature scale. So you may have been lied to your science teachers in high school and they told you that um, the Kelvin temperature scale is this special scale that tells you the absolute temperature um, but there are more than one absolute temperature scale. So anytime you see the word scale, in fact, you could define many uh, different scales um, and convert between them. So they're all technically equivalent. And so that's what I'll show now. Um, given the fact that we have the freezing point um, definition for two temperature scales and the um, boiling point uh, definition for two temperature scales, we can now convert between the two temperature scales. Um, <clears throat> I'm debating if I want to let you guys do this or if you want me to do this. Um, it's not difficult, um, but I wonder if I should let you guys think about how to do that. Um, it's not in the book. The answer is in the book, but it's not given as like an example or anything in the book, but I, I think it'd be a good exercise for you guys to just kind of warm up and and think about this problem. So let me pose the question to you a little bit uh, more precisely. So the question would be, uh, well, this the statement of the problem, I guess, find a formula which converts a temperature find a formula which converts a temperature in degrees Celsius we'll call that T degrees C to the same temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So notice the language that I've used here. It's, I'm being very precise in my language here. Find a formula which converts a temperature in degrees Celsius to the same temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. They're the same temperature, but they will not have the same number, right? The number on the scale is unique for that scale, but it's really the same temperature. So zero degrees Celsius and 32 degrees Fahrenheit 
are the same temperature, just different scales. Okay, so you're looking for a formula which is maybe uh, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit equals something, 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 and there's a um, temperature in degrees Celsius in here. Um, okay, so that's the uh, problem statement there. That's kind of what I'll say there without giving away too much, um, you know, too, too many hints or anything, but um, there I'll leave all of this information up on the board. And here's what we'll do. We'll put we'll put it into breakout rooms so that way you guys can you're not all by yourself thinking about it. You can maybe discuss some ideas you have with others. Um, let's do groups of uh, two to three. Um, does anybody not have a microphone so I can maybe make sure there's somebody who can talk in each group? Let me know if you don't have a microphone. Okay, Jew doesn't have a microphone. Okay, I think the people you're already with, I think they have microphones. All right, let me just open them all up. Okay, go ahead, join your room and work on this problem here. Take a picture if, you, if you're still copying maybe, um, and then copy it in later. All the rooms are open. I'll go ahead and uh, pause the recording. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and try this out yourself. Don't, uh, don't look up the answer or anything. Give it a good uh, shot there. Um, try to come up with a formula which converts between degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. So we're back and um, the formula that we came up with here is um, right here. I'll box it in red. So the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 32. And we can just quickly check over here on the side that this formula works for those temperatures. So if I plug in zero for the temperature in Celsius, I indeed get 32 for the temperature in Fahrenheit. And if I plug in 100 degrees Celsius, I get 180 plus 32, which indeed is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So the formula seems to work. Um, here's a follow-up question though. And I'll put you guys back into your groups to work this one out again. At what temperature do the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales agree? Meaning, what is the temperature where the numerical value of the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and the temperature in degrees Celsius is the same number? Okay, so one way to do it, and I'm just going to give this hint before I send you guys off, is to say T in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to T in degrees Celsius, and then maybe just write that as T. So plug T in to both sides of the equation and then solve for T. Since they're both the same, then you don't really need to distinguish between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Any questions about that before I put you back into the, the same groups as before? Okay, so I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll come around in a minute to check on your progress to send you into the rooms. If you're watching on YouTube, give this one uh, a shot again yourself. I'll pause the recording and we'll be back shortly. Okay, so welcome back. So um, if you were able to answer this question, you saw that negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit was equal to negative 40 degrees Celsius. So let me know in the chat um, if that's what you got, or you can give me a thumbs up here on Zoom. So how many were able to show that minus 40 degrees Celsius and minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit are the same temperature? Okay, so let's quickly go through it because I think maybe some of you are a little bit confused about it. So um, the way to do that is follow this prescription that I kind of um, laid out here. So plug T in on both sides. So the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to call it T. And the temperature in degrees Celsius, we're going to call T. 
and those two t's are the same t because we're looking for the temperature where the two have the same numerical value. So I can solve this expression for t. Um, in order to do that, I can subtract the t to the other side. Um, so if I subtract 9 fifths t from 5 over 5t, I get minus 4 fifths t. And that is equal to 32. So this tells us right away that the, the value of t has to be negative, right? Um, I can multiply 5 on both sides and divide by negative 4. So that gives me 160 if I multiply by 5, and then I need to divide by negative 4. So I end up with minus 40. And then, of course, that minus 40 means that the temperature minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to the temperature minus 40 degrees Celsius, according to our original assumption. So we'll write it right here as well. So minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit minus 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, uh, any questions about that? Give me a thumbs up if we're ready to go to the next topic. Okay, so let's go ahead and move forward. So next up, I've prepared a little bit of um, about absolute temperature scale here, kind of found some info online. Um, the idea of an absolute temperature scale is to base your temperature scale on physical properties of a gas. So the volume of a gas changes based on temperature and um, based on pressure and based on how much of a gas you have. If you pump more gas into a container, you can increase temperature. Um, so Boyle, uh, scientist uh, who was active in the mid 1600s, um, this experiment took place in 1662, or rather his publication of, of his results took place in 1662. Um, this was his experiment over here. Um, so I've labeled it Boyle's experiment over here on the right side, um, over here. So basically what Boyle did was he took some gas and trapped it inside of a glass tube by filling the tube with mercury. So one side of the tube is closed. That would be this side right here. This side of the gas glass tube is closed and there's some air trapped in there and he's got some mercury that he can pour in at the top. The top side is open, right? So if you have air inside um, of a, a chamber like this where it's trapped, you can imagine if I keep adding mercury here, I'm going to change colors here. If I keep adding this mercury right here, then I'm adding more and more pressure to that gas uh, inside the, the orange region here, right? So if I add more and more mercury uh, to the purple side, I increase the pressure on the orange side by an amount equal to the weight of the mercury, right? Uh, Pascal's principle, right? So there's, we only have fluids here. So if we add more weight on the other side, that's force uh, over an area, the diameter, uh, the, the, uh, the cross-sectional area of the tube, right? So that is a pressure being applied and that pressure is transmitted equally to every point in the fluid. That's Pascal's principle. So Boyle took some data, obviously, he's performing an experiment and trying to elucidate a law of nature. And in this particular experiment, the temperature is actually held constant. Why is the temperature held constant? Well, if you have a tube like this and you're in the lab, right, and the temperature of the room stays fixed, you're not heating anything up or cooling anything down, then there's no reason for the temperature to change. So what he notices is that as he increases the pressure by adding more mercury, he decreases the volume of the gas. And this was the first, um, uh, the kind of the one of the first, not necessarily the first, but one of the first experiments, which was leading to this idea of an absolute temperature scale. Okay, 
Um, other uh, experiments were performed subsequently where pressure was held constant and the temperature of the gas was changed and the same effect was noticed. As the temperature decreases, the volume would also decrease. And that was used, that was later used to determine what is now known as the absolute zero temperature or one of the first ways that was used to determine this idea of absolute zero temperature, which is the temperature at which a gas would have zero volume. Now, um, of course, that doesn't make any sense because we have atoms, right? Atoms have volume. Um, but in the days before atoms, right, then presumably that kind of makes sense, right? We could shrink the volume of a gas down to zero. Okay, so what is the result of Boyle's experiment? Well, he noticed that the pressure times the volume was relatively constant. Given the data that he had, the experimental, uh, uh, excuse me, the measuring technology that he had available to him at the time, when he looks at these numbers, he sees 1,400, 1,400 on every single one of these numbers, 1,400, right? There's always some uncertainty in your measurement. And so he noticed pressure times volume, that's gotta be constant. So if I have pressure times volume uh, at constant temperature, Pressure times volume is constant. Okay. And this is the makings of what's called the ideal gas law, which we'll um, <clears throat> see later in the section here. Or not later in this section, but later in this chapter. You can um, imagine for a second that you have an initial state of, uh, of a gas and a final state of a gas or state one and state two where you've changed the pressure and so the volume must also change to compensate so that the product of the two uh, remains constant. To give a concrete example, if I double the pressure, the volume has to be reduced to half the original volume so that the product is the same. You can encapsulate that in a formula by saying P1 V1 equals P2 V2, right? So if P uh, V equals constant, then that means P1 times V1 has to be equal to P2 times V2 at constant temperature. I think there's another um, little bit of information that's often overlooked um, when these gas laws are taught. Um, especially when they're first introduced, but it's, it's quite important to understand. The fact that over here in the orange part of the, um, uh, that I've drawn on the diagram here, there is no change to the number of atoms in that gas. The gas is confined in space. There's no way for any gas to escape or for any gas to enter in to that um, region. And so the number of molecules is also constant in this experiment. So let's go ahead and add that. So at constant temperature and at constant number of molecules. Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> Uh, just briefly, let me give you an idea of how you could uh, elucidate the relationship between um, temperature and volume. Um, what you can do is you can take a very similar setup here. Um, let me actually go ahead and grab the same image again over here from the web. Oops. You could imagine taking the same kind of um, situation here and instead of adding more mercury at the top, just take this thing and put it in an ice water bath. So take this system here and just put it in ice. OK. 
right? If you do that, then what would you be doing? You would be reducing the temperature, right? And then again, you could measure, so we put this thing in an ice bath, you could measure that change in volume again, right? And this time, because the, uh, the mercury here is, um, now actually you have to be a little bit more careful because the mercury will expand or contract. Um, mercury will expand and contract based on the temperature. So you have to be a little bit more careful than this. Probably a better way to do it would be to not use a J shape like this, but to just, um, to just, if you could just dip the gas part into an ice bath. So actually what I've drawn here is not, it is not, uh, accurate. Um, but if you could just dip the gas part, so you wouldn't use this J tube, you'd use like a straight tube maybe and just stick the gas part in the water, something like this maybe. Um, So here is the gas here. It's a very crude drawing here, but um, so just the gas part there is in an ice bath. Um, so you're just cooling down the gas and you're looking at how the volume changes. And then what you would figure uh, from that is that as the temperature decreases, the volume decreases. So that means that volume over temperature at constant pressure and constant number of molecules, I'll just put constant number, that V over T is constant. I think that's pretty intuitive that if you take a, for example, blow up a balloon, get a party balloon at home, just blow it up and stick it in the freezer and see what happens, right? Um, or in the refrigerator, uh, or do both as a matter of fact, and see the difference in how much the volume changes, right? Um, there's a number of household experiments you could do to verify this kind of stuff, right? Um, so yeah, so volume divided by temperature is constant. And you could write down kind of a like an initial and a final type of equation. So initial state one equal to initial state, uh, the, or sorry, the ratio of uh, the initial volume to temperature for the initial state is equal to the ratio of those two in the final state. Okay. Um, I don't remember the names of all these laws. One of them is called Charles Law. The other one is called Gay-Lussac's Law. And then there's also an Avogadro's law, and you can put all of them together in what's called the ideal gas law. Okay. So the ideal gas law combines Boyle's law, uh, Gay-Lussac's law, and Charles' law into one law, and Avogadro's law. So the ideal gas law says that the pressure times the volume uh, is equal to the number of moles of the gas times some gas constant R. So R is the gas constant um, and then that constant uh, times the temperature of the gas. Okay, so pressure times the volume of the gas is equal to the number of moles in the gas uh, times this gas constant times the temperature of the gas. And this temperature right here is defined so that when T equals zero, this implies that the volume of the gas equals zero. So in other words, this is absolute temperature. Absolute temperature is just a fancy way of um, saying you're talking about a temperature related to the physical properties, the extrinsic properties of the gas. So in other words, it's volume, for example. Later we'll see, and actually I don't know if we'll get there, but we'll see that uh, you can define the temperature of a gas by the kinetic energy of the molecules that make up the gas. And that is the, um, 
that is the modern definition of temperature. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and move forward. If there are no questions, let me know if there is a question. Are we all good on this? I'm assuming a lot of us have seen it in chemistry already um, in high school or if you've taken chem here at Florida College or somewhere. There will be problems involving the ideal gas law on the homework, a couple. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move forward. So I only saw one there. Okay. Sammy, Liliana, are we good? Okay, let's go ahead and move forward then. Um, the next concept uh, that we'll talk about here is um, thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, um, for all intents and purposes, for what we need from this concept, we can say that thermodynamic equilibrium is achieved when the temperatures of two systems are equal, okay? Um, since we're not trying to do chemistry or anything like that, where you could in principle have two systems where the temperatures are the same, but you have some sort of chemical reaction happening, then you have to be a little bit more precise about what you mean by thermodynamic equilibrium. But for our situation here in physics, where we're not necessarily doing chemistry, when the temperature of two systems are the same, then they're in thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay. So for physics, uh, not chemistry although of course as physicists we can describe what happens with chemical reactions so don't get the wrong impression that we don't know what to do when chemistry is happening we do know what to do but just for our purposes in this class we're going to avoid um, descriptions of chemical reactions right so for physics for us um, if if we have two systems a and b okay uh, let's maybe let's color code here maybe a is blue maybe b is orange here is system a Here is system B. Notice I've drawn the two systems overlapping a little bit. That's fine. They could completely overlap, in fact. System A could be oxygen molecules in the air. System B could be the nitrogen molecules in the air. Um, it's okay for the systems to overlap as long as they're in contact somehow. So it could be uh, system A is a block of iron and system B is a block of copper, and they're just literally in contact. Or system A could be some gas, and system B is some other gas, and um, the two gases are mixed. So it could be any number of different situations. Um, so two systems, uh, so for physics, if we have two systems A and B uh, that are in contact, I'll put the word contact in quotation marks again there are many different situations don't necessarily have to have quote unquote contact in the colloquial sense of the word um, uh, and the temperature of system a is equal to the temperature of system b then the two systems are in thermodynamic equilibrium. OK. 
okay? So the two are in thermodynamic equilibrium if they're at the same temperature. Now, if we were doing chemistry, how could we improve this definition of thermodynamic equilibrium? We could say something along the lines of the two systems have to be at the same temperature and on average, there are no chemical reactions going on. And that word average is really important. So you could have chemical reactions still happening, but on average, if you look at the two systems, nothing overall has changed. So for example, um, you can combine hydrogen and oxygen to make water, right? You could also break water down to make hydrogen and oxygen. So if you have chemical reactions going on, you have hydrogen and oxygen combining to form water, and you also have water breaking down to form hydrogen and oxygen. If both of those reactions are occurring simultaneously, and so there's no net change, you would say that system is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so you can modify this definition just a little bit and say that on average, there are no chemical reactions going on. Really what we should say is there's no exchange, there's no exchange of energy on average, but um, yeah, there you go. So that's how you could improve uh, the definition there slightly if you wanted to include uh, a little bit of chemistry. Okay, so um, this brings us to what's called the zeroth law in thermodynamics. The zeroth law, it seems almost trivial to state it out, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. This is our first thermodynamic law that we're coming across. So this is just simply based on observation, right? This law has never been broken in the history of our doing experiments for hundreds of years, the zeroth law has never been broken. So it's been elevated to the status of a physical law, right? And I've run out of space, so I have to write it down here at the bottom. And that is that if two systems, you know what, let me just, uh, let me paraphrase a little bit. I don't wanna copy just straight from the book. So uh, if we have system A, system A, is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Let's just put equilibrium, EQ, is in equilibrium with uh, system B. We used orange for B. Can you guys hear the kids outside? <laughs> uh, system A is in uh, equilibrium with system B. And system B is in equilibrium with a third system, system C. And I'll just use EQ again. EQ means equilibrium, not equation, okay? So equilibrium here for EQ. If you want to write that on the side, maybe to remind yourself. Um, we'll use green, I guess, for uh, system C here. So, oh, whoops, I got to write system. Is in equilibrium uh, with system C. Then system A, and I can copy again here, then system A is in equilibrium. with system C. So it almost seems like a trivial statement, right? Um, if you have two systems, A and B, and they're in equilibrium, but B is also in equilibrium with uh, third system, system C, then it must be the case that system A is also in equilibrium with system C. It's, I like to think of it almost as like a transitive property of geometry, right? It's like if A is congruent to B, and B is congruent to C, right? Then A is congruent to C. Um, oh, I put an extra word in here then. There's no then there. So, um, so system A in equilibrium with system B and system B is in equilibrium with system C and system A is also in equilibrium with system C. It's just something, it's, it's almost, 
it's almost trivial to say it out loud, but um, it's a very important fact, right? Because um, if it wasn't the case, then we'd have some weird kind of um, uh, creation of energy, so to speak. And you could you could actually design if 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 the zeroth law was not true, you could design um, thermodynamic engines which produce energy from nothing. Okay, so it has to be true because we cannot create engines that produce energy for free. Any questions about that? Um, does it make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you're good on that. Okay. All right, uh, now we're gonna head into a new topic, um, seemingly unrelated, but very much so related. And that is thermal expansion. And here we'll be able to maybe do some examples uh, or maybe uh, one example. Um, I don't know, how, how are we doing on time here? Are we gonna be able to finish the chapter? We have about an hour and a half. I think we'll be able to finish the chapter. Um, there's a lot of topics towards the end of the chapter that actually um, we're not going to be tested on. I promise you that. Um, but maybe a one homework question or something just to kind of make sure that you learn it. Um, so, yeah. So thermal expansion. Let's get into thermal expansion. Thermal expansion is the idea that if I have, uh, let's say, a metal rod like this, and really I have any solid substance, so any rigid, solid substance. If you're dealing with liquids and gases, sometimes things can get a little bit complicated in terms of um, how they expand, um, how, like, uh, again, so, rigid solid substances is what this applies to. It does apply um, to some gases and some liquids, but there are some special cases where some weird stuff can happen. Um, but let's take a look at, um, for a solid substance here, like a metal rod, we can heat a metal rod. So let's maybe label these like, this is the cold one. And this is the hot one. And when I say cold and when I say hot, I mean always relative. So what cold and hot means here is that the cold one is at a lower temperature than the hot one. It doesn't necessarily have to be glowing red hot like your light bulb, right? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be hot to the touch. As long as the cold one is colder than the hot one. That's all that I mean there. Um, we can measure the amount of change in length, delta L, compared to the initial length of the rod at the colder temperature, okay? And when we perform these measurements, we see a nice linear relationship. So we see that the rod, the amount of expansion in the rod, delta L, um, let's start with a proportionality statement we see that the change in length of the rod is directly proportional to the change in temperature of the rod, okay? Also, we see that if I have a longer rod that I'm heating, I also get more length expansion. So the length expansion due to the change in temperature is proportional to both the change in temperature and the initial length of the rod, okay? So for example, if I have, uh, if I just have like a, a steel beam in, in like in my yard somewhere, it's maybe it's like a foot long, okay? In the winter, that thing is gonna be a little bit smaller than it is in the summer. In the summer, it's gonna be a little bit longer than the winter. Um, that effect is not really noticeable to me. But if I'm looking at, something like the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a very, very, very long bridge, right? Isn't the bridge is, is like over a mile long, right? I can't remember exactly how long it is, but it's very long, right? So the length expansion for the Golden Gate Bridge from 
winter to summer is going to be way more dramatic than just some foot long steel beam I have in my backyard. So that then becomes an engineering challenge to deal with that expansion. Because if you don't deal with that expansion, we've already seen what can happen um, in our uh, on, in the chapter on elasticity, uh, stress and strain and fracture, right? If, um, if the shear forces are too great, or if the stress uh, on, a, on, a, on a material is too great, then that material begins to deform, right? And so bridges and, and also tall buildings um, between winter and summer weather, you have to account for those expansions um, in the design of the building so that nothing buckles and the building doesn't collapse or the bridge collapses. Um, so we have to be careful about that. Okay, so there's a proportionality constant. So we combine these two things and we see that delta L is equal to alpha, which is a coefficient of uh, thermal expansion or coefficient of linear expansion or thermal coefficient of linear expansion. I've seen it called many different things, um, but it's basically a constant that applies to a particular material. So if I'm talking about iron, alpha is the same for no matter how much iron I have. So if I have you know, a small beam of iron, or if I have a Golden Gate bridge, much of iron, it's the same value of alpha. Um, and then the initial length L0 and the change in temperature delta T. Okay, so there is our equation form to describe the expansion. If we want to, we can write um, this equation in terms of um, an initial state and a final state. We could say that delta L is like the final length um, minus the initial length, and L0 is like the initial length, right? Um, and we could add the initial length to the other side. I'll just go ahead and skip the algebra on this. You can verify this for yourself. Uh, pretty straightforward. And I'll just write down the equation that the book has here. So it's L equals L0 times 1 plus alpha delta T. This. And maybe box this one in blue or something. So this is another equation, which is it's exactly the same here. So these two equations are exactly the same equation, just rearranged. Um, whichever form happens to be more useful for you. Now, uh, in the ideal gas law, you're required to plug in um, uh, an absolute temperature for the value of T. But in an equation like this, um, because uh, there's a delta T, you have a little bit more freedom. You can plug in an absolute temperature uh, change, or you can plug in uh, I should be I probably should be a little bit more precise. So for the ideal gas law, usually people use the Kelvin absolute temperature scale. And so the gas constant R is given in terms of units which have Kelvin. And so you have to plug in Kelvin for T. Um, for an equation like this, which has a delta T, you don't have to do that because the Celsius temperature scale and the Kelvin scale are related by the addition or subtraction of a number. So when you take a difference, a final minus initial, that constant just disappears from your equation. So um, the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus uh, 273. Okay. So notice that the factor in front of the temperature in degrees Celsius is a one. So there's a one right here. So the delta T for Kelvin and the delta T for degrees Celsius is the same. And so, so this implies that delta T for Kelvin is equal to delta T for degrees Celsius. 
you'll notice that I'm not saying degrees Kelvin. Um, nowadays, a lot of people are saying degrees Kelvin and um, that's it's fine to do so generally in the scientific community at the research level. I have read research papers in which practicing physicists, research physicists have said degrees Kelvin and also not said degrees Kelvin, just said Kelvin. Um, I tend to prefer not saying degrees Kelvin, although Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale, it is not the only absolute temperature scale. So it does make sense uh, to, to say maybe degrees Kelvin because it's not a unique temperature scale um, describing absolute temperature. But also I kind of like that you can distinguish between uh, kind of an arbitrarily defined temperature scale based on, you know, like freezing point or boiling point of water, which is what degrees Celsius is versus an absolute temperature scale um, where the, uh, uh, the zero, the, the absolute zero temperature corresponds to zero on the absolute temperature scale. So um, there are there's a there are kind of reasons to do to go either way. I kind of like distinguishing between an absolute scale and um, you know a scale on a thermometer. So you'll see me say Kelvin, not degrees Kelvin, and you'll see me write K for the units, not degrees K. Okay. Um, but if you decide to write degrees K, I won't, you know, I won't be upset about that. Um, so deltas are the same for Kelvin and degrees Celsius. And that is because the uh, Kelvin scale um, or the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale are uh, simply addition of a number. Okay, let's, um, before we jump into an example, let's take a look quickly at a table. And I think I'll just grab this table straight from the book here. We can just look at a couple values. Um, so these are the coefficients of linear expansion is what they're called in your book. They also give coefficients for volume expansion. Um, and that applies uh, for these same solid materials. Um, you'll notice that in many cases, the volume expansion constant is roughly three times the linear expansion constant. Um, the book doesn't have a great picture explaining why that is, but um, I think the easiest way to understand why that is, is, um, is basically to understand the different, um, let's see if I can draw a quick picture here. There are different parts of the expansion which contribute more to the volume than others. So if this is the initial volume of a, um, of a cube, if the length expands by the same amount in each direction due to heating, so if this is delta L here, and it's increased by that much, right? So this much delta L, so this much delta L here as well. Then of course they all expand equally. So there must be this much delta L here. There must be this much delta L here, right? So we can start to, um, okay. So this is in two dimensions. So I almost, I almost forgot the third dimension. So then it must also expand in this direction, the same amount, and it must also expand in this direction, the same amount. And so we can start to connect these pieces. So let's, let's try to connect these pieces here. So trying to connect the pieces, I'm trying to do so in a way that um, doesn't, doesn't look too ugly here. Um, you let me know if it's understandable or not. Um, I forgot to do this side here, this side here. Um, so there's that. And then of course there's the backward expansion there as well. Bear with me here on this. We're almost there. We're almost there. Okay. Um, for the diagram here, this is good enough. Now this looks super messy. Let me clean it up a little bit. Um, so that would have been roughly right there. 
let me clean it up a little bit. Um, here's what we need to understand. There's some pieces here to this expansion. This right here, this piece, this piece right here, then there's a little purple piece right here, a little tiny piece right here of, of volume expansion right there. Um, but this red face is by far the biggest amount of the volume expansion. Okay. Um, so that piece right there. And then there is, uh, there is a light blue piece right here which is bigger than that purple piece, which is the same as this light blue piece right here. Is it starting to come together? It's not looking as bad anymore with the colors, I hope. So can we all see that the red piece is the biggest part of the expansion? Can we all see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that the red piece is the biggest part of the expansion. The blue piece is the second largest, and then the purple piece is the smallest. Well, okay, so we're all so we're all getting it. okay, good. So, because metals they do expand when they're heated, they don't expand that much though. They don't expand a lot. So when you're looking at real expansion, the red piece is orders of magnitude larger than the blue and the purple piece. So when we write down the expansion for the volume, we throw away the expansion due to the blue and the purple piece because it's much, much smaller than the red piece. So it's not, um, it's not that it's not there, it's just so much smaller than the red expansion. And so what we do, you can actually work this out by hand. I'm not going to go through that, though. You can work out that the change in volume is proportional. This is just by assumption, by the way. The change in volume is proportional to the initial volume um, times the change in temperature, just like the length there. But you can work out what beta is approximately and beta is approximately three times alpha and the way that you do that is you plug in that the volume of course is length times length times length and each of those lengths expand by an amount l alpha times l0 times delta t and you can multiply everything out and what you see is that the change in volume the biggest part of the change in volume is three alpha V zero times delta T. The other terms are way smaller than this three alpha term. Okay. Um, and so that's it. That's what we do. We say approximately the change in volume is going to be three alpha V zero times delta. So look, for example, here at aluminum brass a brass is approximately three still copper approximately three right three times 17 is 51 gold three times 14 42 right on the money right um now here 12 uh yeah oh no this one is right uh this one is times three so iron or steel lead uh okay lead is maybe the one uh no no this one is also yeah this one's right on the money actually what am i saying uh, this one also three look at I mean all of these they're all three right they're all three okay now quartz we're deviating a little bit quartz is off by 20 percent right three times four is 12 so 1.2 so it's off by 20 percent so okay metals this rule of three times alpha works pretty good now we start to get into some maybe some more organics uh, materials like uh, rocks and and other things Right. Okay. Now it's not, it's not three anymore. Right. Look, we have ranges for marble, right? We have ranges gasoline there, uh, mercury, ethyl, alcohol, glycerin, water. These are liquids. They're not solid materials. There is no linear expansion, right? What would that even mean? You can't have a rigid structure for a liquid. So they don't have any. So they're the beta values are just given. You can just measure the change in volume there and uh, measure a beta value for that. Okay, so, but it looks pretty good, right? Three alpha looks pretty good there. 
Okay, so let's maybe let's try some examples here for this. Um, so the book, uh, the book has an example here for us. Um, and I'll go ahead and copy that down right here. I'm going to just go ahead and type it so the text is larger. Um, so the example is called, oh, how come? Oh, because I zoomed in. That's right. Uh, that's right. I zoomed in. Okay, so let's do that again. So bridge, bridge expansion. Like I said, this is a big, uh, a big effect for bridges, buildings, things like that. If you actually go in the parking structure at Fullerton College, you should see every 30 feet or so, or every, um, no, every 100 feet, some number of feet, you know, maybe 50 feet, just depends on the, um, the design and the materials that are used. You'll see like these interlocking joints that allow for the expansion of the concrete. Um, there's there also may be some steel beams in that concrete that also needs to be taken account for. Okay, so the steel bed of a suspension bridge is 200 meters long at 20 uh, degrees Celsius. If the extremes of temperature to which it might be exposed are minus 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I can just write it out. That's fine. Um, am I spelling Celsius? Is it? No, no, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, I think it's right. Let me know if I'm wrong on that. Um, th minus 30 degrees Celsius uh, to plus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, how much will it contract? and expand. So we're looking at how much this thing, how, how short this thing is going to be, and we're looking at how long this thing can be, right? Two very important design parameters when you're designing something like this. Got to know how long it could possibly be, how short it could possibly be, because that's going to add stresses um, to that material. I'll give you the alpha value for steel just straight from the table. So right here, iron or steel, 12 times 10 to the negative six. And the units on that are degrees uh, Celsius inverse. So one over degrees Celsius. So this is alpha for uh, steel. Okay. And uh, let me put you uh, in groups again for this, but maybe we'll do new groups. And uh, those of you who are, who are just watching the recording, again, try this one on your own, and I'll be back shortly. Okay, so we're back. We're going to go ahead and share uh, the problem again here. So the question uh, of how much... Um, expansion or contraction this bridge is going to undergo due to uh, thermal uh, changes in temperature. Um, we want to apply the equation that we just saw, delta L equals uh, alpha L0 uh, delta T in both cases. So for a temperature decrease and for a temperature increase, right? So we could look at two different cases here, delta T Let's maybe let's call it delta T cold. When we have cold weather, our initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. And our final temperature is negative 30 degrees Celsius. Excuse me, I wrote that backwards. It's our final temperature. Our final temperature is minus 30 degrees Celsius. And our initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. It's for a total change of minus 50 degrees Celsius. And our change in temperature in the case of uh, the hot summer's day here is 40 degrees Celsius for our final temperature. Again, our initial temperature is the same 20 degrees Celsius for a change of 20 degrees Celsius. So plugging these quantities in, we see that the change in length on the cold day uh, is negative 
0.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. You want to translate this into maybe a little bit, uh, something a little bit easier to understand. This is minus 12 centimeters. So it means this thing changes by um, quite a significant amount, right? This is, um, how many inches is this? Roughly uh, four or five inches. That's quite a bit of expansion, right? Um, 12 centimeters, or excuse me, contraction because it's getting smaller, right? So whenever you have a, a negative number, you probably noticed in doing the problem when it's contracting, a negative number means it's getting smaller, right? Um, for the uh, for the hot summer's day, the expansion we get for that is 4.8 times 10 to the 2 meters. Again, putting that into centimeters, sorry, 10 to the minus 2. Putting that into centimeters, that's 4.8 uh, centimeters of expansion, okay? Um, any questions about that? Were we all able to get these answers here? You can let me know with a thumbs up. Or if there's a question, tell me your question. Uh, only a small portion of you giving a thumbs up. As, are there any, any things I need to clarify here for this question? There's a couple of chats here. Uh, I have a question. I know it's a contraction, but shouldn't length not be a negative number? Uh, it's not a negative. Uh, it's not that the length is negative. It's that the change in length is negative. So the final length is smaller than the initial length. So both the lengths are, are positive, right? Um, so if we wanted to know the length when it's cold, we would do uh, this equals L0, which is the 200 plus the change in length uh, when it gets cold. So ultimately what that means is that our um, length when it's cold is 100 and, uh, oops, uh, oh, I can't write 100 um, and what? So minus uh, 0.12, so 199.12. Uh, meters. So that is the length of it when it's cold. So it is a positive length, right? Um, we wouldn't be able to uh, contract it so much that the length somehow went to zero and then negative. But the change, of course, a change can always be um, positive or negative. Um, likewise, you could also really quickly compute the, uh, the length for when it's hot. So I'll just show that as well. Um, L zero uh, plus delta L hot. And what we would get there would be 200.048 meters um, for, the, for the length on a hot day. But even a small length expansion like that, 4.8 centimeters, is quite significant considering the tensile strength of a steel beam. Right, as we saw in the chapter on uh, elasticity, stress, and strain. Right, the um, the the uh, elastic modulus for steel is a very very big number. So if there's gonna be this much expansion, you could go and calculate how much force you would need to get that same expansion, and you would see that that's an enormous force, um, and and therefore there would be enormous forces involved in this problem that could destroy the bridge, could buckle the steel beam and ultimately destroy the bridge. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic. We've done some problems. We've talked about expansion, but we haven't talked about why there's expansion. So let's talk about why there's expansion. Okay, um, so why is there expansion? Well, let's so why do things expand? In order to understand why things expand, we have to understand what it means to increase the temperature of a material. When we think about a solid material, we can think about 
uh, atoms kind of in a structured way, right? We've kind of talked about that already. So whenever you have a solid rigid substance, you can always imagine some structure to those atoms. I'm trying to draw this um, as accurately as possible here where all of the molecules are kind of equally spaced which is a kind of structure that you can have in nature where all the atoms are equally spaced. Um, but in addition to these atoms uh, structure, there's also atomic vibrations or oscillations as we've talked about in, in the previous chapter, right? So we have this idea that things are vibrating and atoms are vibrating and the amount that they vibrate depends on their temperature, how hot or how cold they are. When the atoms are hotter, they're vibrating more. Okay, so um, I can maybe draw that a little bit by kind of um, putting maybe these little symbols here on the sides of the atoms to indicate that they are kind of shaking back and forth. And they're not just shaking left and right, they're also shaking up and down, left, right, diagonally, and so forth. Kind of in a random way, in a Brownian motion kind of fashion that we saw, that we kind of discussed earlier in the lecture. So these atoms are vibrating back and forth, right? And you might imagine, in a similar fashion to what we've seen already, you might imagine that there's a maximum amplitude for the vibration, right? So from here to here, right? That would be like the, I guess I can just do solid lines here. That would be the amplitude of the vibration. Okay, and we saw that the amplitude of the vibration for a simple harmonic oscillator, which atoms in a solid for a lattice structure like this one, a crystal structure like this one, can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, it's not going to be uh, it's it's not going to be an exact description to get a really good description, you have to include quantum physics in there to account for the fact that you know the atom itself is kind of doing some weird stuff you can't exactly say where an atom is or where it's headed. Um, but to a good approximation, we can um, we can use the, the idea of a simple harmonic oscillator. If you remember, a simple harmonic oscillator um, has uh, energy equal to one half uh, k uh, times the amplitude squared, right? And so the amplitude of the, the vibration is, the square of the amplitude of the vibration is proportional to the energy that that molecule has, okay? And we also saw that, of course, we could translate this for a simple harmonic oscillator. We could say one half mv squared, excuse me, is equal to one half ka squared, right? And we could relate the amplitude and the velocity, right? We can cancel the factors of half, divide by square root, right? We can see that v would be plus or minus, plus or minus square root k over m times that amplitude, right? And so the, vol uh, the vo volume, the velocity and the amplitude are proportional to one another, right? So the same kind of idea uh, is going on here at the atomic scale. And what we do is we associate temperature with kinetic energy of the molecules. So kinetic energy of the molecules. 
okay? Now, the reason we do that is because it's collisions between molecules which transfer energy, okay? Um, recall all the way back to our chapter on momentum, right? When we have a collision, there's an impulse associated with that change in momentum when we have a collision. There's a force that is exerted between those uh, colliding particles and, um, and that force exerted over a time it causes an impulse, a change in momentum. And that's what happens when, for example, you stick your hand on the hot stove, the, the molecules in the stove are vibrating much faster than the molecules in your hand because the stove is hotter. And so since the stove has molecules which have more kinetic energy than your molecules, when they collide, energy is going to flow from the stove to your hand. Okay. And so when energy flows is when the temperature of a, of a, of a system is different than the temperature of another system. And energy always flows from the hot system to the cold system. That's actually another law of thermodynamics. That's called the, um, the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so temperature is related to the kinetic energy of these molecules. And the reason we're doing that again is because everything has to be based on the transfer of energy. If you touch something and it feels hot, there's a reason for that. It's because when the molecules in your hand and the stove collide, energy is transferred from the stove to your hand. The only way to describe that transfer of energy is through the collisions of molecules. That's called the kinetic theory. That's why the chapter is called temperature and kinetic theory. So the kinetic theory part is the collisions part, the collisions of these atoms with one another, the collisions of molecules. Okay, so the temperature and the kinetic energy of the molecules are related. The two are proportional. There's a proportionality constant there. It's called uh, Boltzmann's constant. It's related to the gas constant. We're not going to talk about that yet, though. I think that actually comes in maybe the next chapter. But um, so now we have an idea of what it means for something to be hot or cold. The molecules will be vibrating more if something is hot. And the molecules will be vibrating less if something is cold. Let's write it down. Let's write it down here. So. So hot substance molecules will vibrate more cold substance molecules will vibrate less okay and when i say more or less i mean relative right it's so a hot substance has to be hotter than something else right so when a substance is hot its molecules will vibrate more than when it was cold if you cool a substance to a lower temperature, its molecules will be vibrating less. Okay, so when you change the temperature of a substance, you change the kinetic energy of the molecules in that substance. Does anybody have any questions up to this point here? So we're not writing any equations or anything like that. I mean, I guess we kind of did, but... Um, I guess we could write one thing here and uh, one little equation which I mentioned already and that is that temperature is proportional to kinetic energy of the molecules. That's technically not an equation though. So any questions? So you can give me a thumbs up if, uh, if that's making sense. Okay. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain why I'm going to explain why now substances expand or why they contract when their temperature increases or decreases respectively, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a conceptual question 
and we'll kind of see where we are from there. And then maybe we'll do like a peer discussion if, um, if not everyone is getting it. Okay, so we've established the idea between uh, the connection between temperature and kinetic energy of molecules. We've established, of course, we know kinetic energy means one half mv squared. So we know kinetic energy is related to the velocity of the molecules squared. And we know that the velocity of the molecules is related to the amplitude of the vibrations of the molecules. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this figure here. Copy this and we're going to put it down here. Okay, and I'm going to get rid of this. Get rid of this. Now, if I take this substance and I add heat to it, I heat it up, I stick it on the stovetop, I, I take this sheet of metal and I stick it in the oven, okay? What's gonna happen is the kinetic energy of the molecules in this substance are going to increase. And so as the kinetic energy increases, the amplitude of the oscillations increase. And so if I heat this thing, the amplitude of the vibrations increase. Oops. And so the molecules or the atoms now take up more space than they did before. As you can see, now the vibrations of the molecules, they start to overlap a little bit. They're not happy anymore. They need to get away from their neighbor. They're pushing their neighbors away from them now. I've heated it up and now they're vibrating so much, they're starting to bang into their neighbors, okay? And as they bang into their neighbors, they're pushing them away from each other. And this happens everywhere in the substance, not just these molecules up at the top, it happens to all the molecules in the substance. So to encapsulate that, what I can do here is I can take this, I can copy it again, paste it over here. And that expansion, as we've seen, is not very much, but it is noticeable, okay? So here we have now a hot. Now the size of the molecules don't change, just the amplitude of their vibrations change. So now we have a hot substance and we have a cold substance. And now what I want to do is I want to um, I want to rescale these just so that it's a little bit less uh, So these are the um, here's what I'll do. I'll make it so that I have this here. Whoops. I'll grab it like this, but I want to change the color of it. Change the color of it to red. Okay, like that. And then I'm going to take this and I am going to put one of these everywhere. So these are my hot molecules now. That's why I've drawn them red. These are my hot molecules. I have to get rid of these ones here. And so the important thing to notice here is that all of the molecules are a little bit further away from their neighbors than they were before. Okay, that is the key point here. Every single neighbor is slightly further from every other neighbor now. Okay, and I will do something to help you visualize that as well here in a second once we establish this new structure. So this is our hot structure here. And what is our cold structure layered on top of this? Well, our cold structure would have been something like this where we have these molecules here like this slightly closer together, right? So take this now. So the molecules before looked something 
like this, right? They were all a little bit closer together. And the one in the center, the one in the center, based on how I've drawn this, remains in the same location, but that's not necessarily uh, something that's true in general. I could have just as easily um, drawn from a different perspective and gotten a, a slightly different, uh, a slightly different um, view of it. Um, for some reason, I can't grab this one. There we go. Yeah, that works. I guess I have to do this every time for some reason. Maybe I made them too small. Oh, what? It just disappeared. Okay, so I think we, I think what we have here is is good enough now um, to understand what's happened. So we can clearly see that the um, the hot substance has now expanded and every single molecule is further away from every other molecule now okay every single molecule is now further from every other molecule okay does anybody have any questions about this anything at all any questions So I'm going to ask you a conceptual question. It's not going to be necessarily an easy question. So maybe you should ask me some questions. Okay, so nobody has any questions. So I will go ahead and ask you all a conceptual question now, and we'll see if we've understood. Okay. Um, first, let me draw. Let me draw a picture first. So suppose we have a metal plate like this. And we drill a hole in the metal plate. Okay. So here's our metal plate. We drill a hole in the metal plate. And the question is, what happens to the size of the hole in the metal plate if the plate is heated if the if the temperature of the plate increases let's put it that way so if the if the temperature of the plate is increased okay so you have three choices one stays the same two gets bigger three gets smaller okay so I'm gonna pause the recording. So if you're watching the recording on YouTube, just try this question out yourself, right? We'll be back in a flash. Go ahead and pause the video. Right, let's... Okay, so um, we're back and um, we actually went forward without recording. So let me just recap real quick. Um, the answer here to this question is that the hole gets bigger. Um, you can draw yourself a circle and imagine atoms on the rim of the circle. 
if the plate expanded into the circle, making the circle smaller, then the atoms would have to get closer together. So it cannot be the case. They have to all get further apart. So the diameter of that circle has to get bigger. Okay, then we went on a, um, a, 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 um, onto a new topic, thermal stress. Um, thermal stress uh, draws on previous knowledge from the chapter on stress and strain. So we uh, saw elastic, uh, the elasticity chapter. Uh, which talked about uh, tensile stress and tensile strain. So what we've done is we've set up an equation here and I'll box it in black here. We've set up this equation where the tensile stress is equal to the thermal stress. So you can imagine uh, materials that want to expand but cannot expand because they are limited um, by the materials around them. So the materials around them um, are blocking them from expanding. Okay, and so we worked out the algebra here um, and came to this equation for thermal stress. I'll box it in black here. Okay, so the thermal stress is proportional to the change in temperature, the elastic modulus, and the thermal coefficient of um, expansion. The book gives a little blurb about concrete slabs, 10 meter concrete slabs. So not even that big, 30 feet by 30 feet uh, concrete slabs in a park. And if you're not careful in how you design the park, a 30 degree Celsius uh, temperature change will result in stresses on the concrete slabs, uh, which are of the order 10 to the six Newtons per meter squared, which will actually break the concrete. The concrete will begin to crack. Okay, so you have to leave little gaps between the concrete slabs to allow for expansion. Okay, now uh, we're ready to go on to the chapter on the gas laws and absolute temperature. We have already talked about the ideal gas law already. We've just done things in a slightly different order. Um, and so uh, I will show some figures from the book and rewrite some of those equations. One figure I want to show in particular here is this figure here. So let me go ahead and set everything up here. So now we're looking at gas laws and absolute temperature. Now you can perform experiments as I alluded to before, such as the one that Boyle performed. Um, and you can look at the relationship between volume and temperature. And what you'll find is that volume of a gas is proportional to the temperature of a gas. And so if you have constant pressure um, situation, for example, if your experiment is exposed to um, the atmosphere, then it would be done at one atmosphere of pressure. That would be constant pressure. Um, so if you change the temperature on, uh, on a gas, uh, its volume will decrease, or sorry, if you change the temperature, its volume will change. If you decrease the temperature, its volume will get smaller and smaller. So what, um, uh, what people did was they performed these experiments and saw a linear relationship between the volume and temperature. And they extrapolated from that line what temperature a gas would have to have so that its volume is zero. So the question that they're trying to answer is what temperature, what temperature would a gas need to have zero volume, right? And that's what we call absolute zero. So this implies a temperature, let's call it maybe T zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. And this is absolute zero.
So if you're wondering where that 273 comes from when you convert between Kelvin and Celsius, that's where it comes from. So um, this is also equal to zero Kelvin, okay, zero Kelvin. Okay, so you perform these experiments, you extrapolate the data until you see where uh, or what temperature uh, you would have to decrease down to until the volume of the gas is zero. Of course, that's not realistic. Again, we have atomic structure for gases, right? So you cannot decrease the volume to zero. Okay, and we already talked about the Kelvin scale, but I'll go ahead and write it down one more time. The temperature in Kelvin is the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273. And um, uh, as I said, uh, volume proportional to temperature at constant um, pressure and constant um, number of molecules. We can write that down again. I'll write V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And this is, um, this I believe is Charles law. Oops, Charles law. And there's also uh, Gay-Lussac's law, which is uh, pressure and um, temperature. So P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Gay-Lussac's law. And then Boyle's law, which was the one where it's product of uh, pressure times volume. So P1, V1 equals P2, V2. This is Boyle's law. There is also other laws, um, uh, Avogadro's law, and you can get all of these laws from, um, you can get all of these laws uh, from um, the ideal gas law. And so really the ideal gas law is really the important one that you wanna remember. So I'll write it one more time. So we've seen it multiple times. So we know how important it, it is, ideal gas law. And you combine all of this information here and with Avogadro's law, which is basically the same as these laws, but where the number of moles changes, um, we have this law here, okay? PV equals NRT. Now, um, the uh, symbols, again, let me just, so P is absolute pressure, so not gauge pressure. Absolute pressure. V is the volume, of course, right? Um, the units that you use for volume, the units that you use for pressure, all of this depends on the units that you have for this gas constant R here. Lowercase n is the number of moles. For those of you who don't know what a mole is, because maybe it's been a long time since you had chemistry or maybe you never had it, one mole is a, a definition um, 6.022 uh, times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So you can think of a mole as a, a dozen, like one dozen is 12 of something. One mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of something. Um, since there are so many atoms or molecules in a gas, or on earth or whatever, however you want to think about it, there's so many of them, we need this enormous number to kind of describe how much of it there is. Um, 
So let me, uh, so R is the gas constant. So let's finish off here before I um, tell you what R is. So gas law. Um, R is the gas constant, and I will give you the gas constant in several different um, uh, units. Um, and then T is, of course, absolute temperature. We're just going to use the Kelvin scale for absolute temperature. So just make sure that when you um, plug into any of these gas laws, Charles law, Gay-Lussac's law, Boyle's law, ideal gas law, Avogadro's law, whatever it is, make sure that you're using Kelvin and not degrees Celsius. If you have a delta, delta T, delta T is the same whether it's degrees Celsius or Kelvin. So it doesn't matter in that case. Um, so the gas constant, this is something you have to perform the experiment and measure what the gas constant is, right? So um, for a couple different uh, systems or a couple different uh, sets of units here, R uh, might be the familiar one I think they use in chemistry mostly is 8.314 uh, joules uh, per mole Kelvin. Okay. And you have to remember that a joule is uh, on the left hand side of the equation, the pressure times volume is going to give you units of energy. Um, so if the pressure is in pascals and the volume is in meters cubed, you will get joules, okay? So the joule part here, you probably should also know that a joule is a pascal times a meter cubed, okay? Don't use liters. Um, there's another gas constant for that. Don't use atmospheres. There's another gas constant for that. You want to use the value uh, 0 0.0821 um, if you have liters and atmospheres. So liter ATM per mole Kelvin. Okay. And then um, if you really want, you can also have the gas constant in terms of calories. So 1.99 calorie per mole Kelvin. Probably even those of you who have taken chemistry have not seen this one before. Okay, so um, these are all SI units, but you can clearly see the differences here, right? So they're, they're all SI units, but they're all different units. Okay, so no, none of these are uh, you know, preferred over the other, whatever you just happen to be given in a particular problem or whatever's the most convenient for you, right? Um, that's the one that you want to go to and use. Um, just make sure that you follow kind of the rules of the equation here as well. So make sure it's absolute pressure, um, make sure it's absolute temperature. Um, and choose the right gas constant. And that's pretty much, those are pretty much the rules of the ideal gas law for problem solving. Um, there's one more thing, and then maybe we can do an example here for the ideal gas law before we go. Um, and that is STP, standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature and pressure. Okay, um, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. And standard pressure is one ATM. Now there may be, um, there may be some differences in the, uh, in the modern definition of standard temperature and pressure. Um, but in this textbook and what we're going to do for our problems and everything, this definition of standard temperature and pressure is what we're going to use. 
this is probably the simplest. So, you know, uh, in one definition of standard temperature and pressure, for example, the pressure is one bar rather than one atmosphere. One bar is like one times 10 to the fifth Pascal. So it's slightly less than one atmosphere. Um, so, you know, th those are small details. We, we just care about being able to solve problems, right? It doesn't necessarily matter what the exact numbers are, right? But this is standard temperature and pressure. Again, just to remind you, this is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, if you need to use Pascals, uh, zero degrees Celsius. Of course, we want to use Kelvin for the ideal gas law. And so if a, if a problem says standard temperature and pressure, it means you want to use 273 Kelvin and not zero degrees Celsius. Okay, we don't want to use Celsius, we want to use Kelvin. Both of these will work though. Um, you can use either or, it just depends on the units you have for your gas constant. Both of these are absolute pressures here um, for the standard pressure. Okay, let's do an example before we go. We have like one minute left and just a little bit of board space left here. So the question here is, what is the volume of one mole of any gas? So determine the volume of one mole of any gas. Assume it behaves like an ideal gas um, at standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Um, the ideal gas law, I didn't mention this, the ideal gas law does not apply for all gases. That's why it's called the ideal gas law. So it works for simple gases like maybe oxygen gas or nitrogen gas, it works pretty good. It works fairly well for noble gases that don't react with anything and they're just single atoms. Um, so like neon um, and the others, I can't remember all their names. But um, yeah, so how do we set this problem up? Let me get you started with that. The first thing that you need to recognize is we're at STP. So that means the temperature is 273 Kelvin. The pressure is one ATM or 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. And we have one mole, just simply from the problem statement there, right? So what is the volume? Okay, how about I put you guys uh, into uh, rooms again? I'll pause the recording here. So if you're watching on YouTube, just try this problem out yourself using the ideal gas law. Okay, we're back. Um, this question should be pretty straightforward. So we start with the ideal gas law here. The ideal gas law says the product of the pressure times the volume is equal to the number of uh, moles times the gas constant times the absolute temperature. We're given the temperature, we're given the pressure, we're given the number of moles, we're being asked to solve for the volume. So we can divide both sides by the pressure so NRT over P and simply plug in the numbers that were given here. So one mole, we need to choose the right units for the gas constant. So let me leave that empty for a second. Our temperature is 273 Kelvin and our pressure is one ATM. So we need the gas constant that has ATM as the units for pressure. So if we scroll back up over here, we did write one that has units of ATM, and that was this one right here. So 0.0821 liter ATM per mole Kelvin. So 0 0.0821 liter ATM per mole Kelvin. And that tells us that the volume of the gas that we're gonna get is going to be is going to have units of liters so atms will cancel kelvin will cancel moles will cancel and we'll be left with liters and what we end up here for the numerical value uh, is 22.4 22.4 liters and we could also convert this to meters cubed 
if we want to convert this to meters cubed, we have to remember that one liter is 10 to the minus three meters cubed. Um, that comes from the fact that one milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter. So we can write this out. So one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter, which means a centimeter cubed. We can convert the uh, centimeters to um, 10 to the minus two. So if we have 10 to the minus two, but it's gonna be cubed to get meters cubed. And on this side, milli is 10 to the minus three, right? So 10 to the minus three liters is equal to 10 to the minus six meters cubed. We can cancel um, on both sides. So one liter equals 10 to the minus three meters cubed. So 22.4 liters is 22.4 times 10 to the minus three meters cubed. And then maybe we could move the decimal place over. I'm running out of space here. Maybe I'll come, um, I'll zoom out. Uh, maybe I can slide it over a little. Okay, it worked. I'll come back over here. So I have, oh no, it actually cut off the, oh, and I can't undo it. Oh yeah, I can, okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll just write it right here. So we'll, we'll zoom in over here, um, right here. So uh, 20, oh, sorry, we're moving the decimal over. So 0. 0, 0.0224 um, meters cubed, right? So if we want to kind of just look at, it's roughly 0. 0.02 cubic meters. So it's not much. It's not much. It seems like it's quite a bit, uh, 22.4 liters, which I mean, yeah, it's that's quite a, like if you're talking about two liter bottles of soda, yeah, 22.4 liters is quite a bit. But if you're looking at cubic meters, of uh for the volume it's not that much imagine you know just like a box of air basically it's not it's not really all that much um so yeah you can maybe work out from here that'd be a nice exercise uh for all of you is to imagine that this volume is um uh, contained inside of a cube and then calculate the side lengths for the cube so set it equal to x cubed, where x is the length of a cube, the side of a cube. So here's, here's a cube here, and the side lengths are all x. Solve for x. OK, that's going to complete uh, the, the lecture for today. We didn't cover everything, but um, we did cover some of the stuff here in the later sections, just a little bit out of order. So hopefully it's not too difficult um for everyone to uh do the few homework problems on the assignment that are from these sections there's not as many as um, there are for like some of the earlier topics that we talked about so the focus is really more towards the front end of the chapter okay so when you're studying for um the final which is right around the corner you want to focus more on those on the topics that we focused on here in the lecture not necessarily the later topics where you're asked maybe a one or two questions on the homework, um, on the homework part one. On part two, there might be another couple questions, but those are the more challenging problems, right? So um, don't study those for the uh, test. Okay, so that's going to end it. So I'll go ahead and end the recording now.